Call of Cthulhu, Edge of Madness, is a Call of Cthulhu 7th edition actual play podcast presented by DM Fiat with me, Dale, as the keeper of arcane lore. Please be advised, Call of Cthulhu is a dark game of cosmic horror. You'll hear descriptions of gore, depravity, helplessness, coercion, and other serious themes. This is not D&D. This is a game where we stare into the abyss and confront things that stare back. a death rattle yeah welcome everyone we're back to call of cthulhu the edge of madness tonight's episode is entitled the legacy of mr corbett it has been two weeks since you investigated the haunting within the old corbett house discovered the cause of the disturbances and exercised Walter Corbett from this realm, very nearly destroying your own lives in the process. And even though it's been two weeks, you're starting to find it difficult to return to the banal normality of life. It's much harder than it was after that horrific night in the Blackwood cabin. Now you've seen too much. You've seen just enough to understand definitively that there are things out there that man was not supposed to know about, that man was not meant to understand. And yet you understand this just well enough that the things you've seen constantly haunt you will never leave you alone again. That's why when Dr. Earl, the impromptu leader of your little paranormal club, invites you over to his home, not for another life-threatening nightmare, but for a simple social call, for a dinner amongst friends. You jump at the chance. Spending your days surrounded by those who have not seen what you have seen. Standing in the middle of your museum exhibit, Trixie, seeing the tourists gawk at the exhibits, seeing your supervisors scoff at your stories of the supernatural. Chambers seated at your desk in the Bureau's regional office just outside Boston, listening to banal cases of fraud, grand theft and robbery across state lines and thinking there's so much more to the world. You jump at this chance to spend just a night 
around to others who've seen what you've seen and to believe you when talk turns to things that exist beyond mortal ken. And so, here we are. A lazy Sunday evening in the leafy suburb of Lexington. A 20-minute drive from downtown Boston. Here is where Eugene Earl currently resides in a turn-of-the-century neo-gothic Victorian-style triple-story manor house, the largest in this sleepy little street by far. As you all pull up on the curb, climb out of your vehicles and greet each other, you can't help but notice a wooden sign on the front lawn still nailed into the dirt. It reads... Cannonan and Co. Real Estate for rent. And there's a sticker that's been emblazoned over it. Simply reads, Leased. It's been two weeks since you've seen each other. And so as you... As you take stock of each other, register the... Weary... Weary lines under each other's eyes and begin your walk up the path through the luscious front garden to Dr. Earl's house. How do you greet each other? Uh, Buck's gonna um, tentatively uh, ask, so has it been as hard for you to get back into, you know, the swing of things since, uh, you know? You, uh, having trouble there, man? Yeah, once you see a dead man come out of a wall, it's, uh, it's really hard to look people in the eye while they, uh, complain about groceries or whatever. Game is having yeah, actually they... having a lot of problems, but he doesn't let it on. Yeah. I'm gonna say, I thought the first time was difficult enough, but with this injury and all the other crazy things we've seen, it's definitely been a lot harder than I thought it would be the second time around. Yeah. Um, Maybe we're the crazy but... ones. We're back. <laughs> For a social call, at least. And yet, as you look into each other's faces, you can see those worry lines writ into each other's skin. You're all having trouble sleeping, and Trixie, as she walks ahead of you, hobbles along, still dragging her ankle, almost like a wounded animal. She seems to have a clean bill of health, but some things leave a permanent mark. And Angel, Angel has not even arrived. Perhaps, perhaps her communications with her gods have finally, finally stolen her mind. So as you approach the house, you see the front door open and out steps a tall, thin man with grey hair, wearing a very neat dinner jacket and slacks. He's holding in his hand what appears to be an empty basket. And as he pulls the door shut, you hear him say, Oh, best of luck with your dinner party. Uh, please tell me all about it. He shuts the door and he turns around and he sees you. He jumps the start. He says, oh, and speaking of, I suppose you're the good doctor's dinner guests. That'd be us. Yep, one and the same. This man wipes his right hand on the breast of his coat and you see that the backs of his fingers are flecked with dirt and grime, almost as if he's spent all day in a garden, perhaps. 
And then he holds out his hand and he says, A pleasure to meet you. I'm Bernard. I live just across the street there. He points and you look over your shoulder and you see a single story house that looks incredibly out of place on the gigantic lot that it's situated upon. Absolutely dwarfed. Absolutely dwarfed by Dr. Earl's house. Okay. He's, uh, he's recently moved in. Uh, I've been doing a neighborly thing, you know, keeping an eye on him, getting to know him, and, you know, I I'm a bit of a green thumb. I got a veggie patch around the back of my house there. As he points, you try to follow the trajectory of his finger, and you can just see behind his tiny house the outline of something made of a structure made of glass glimmering in the streetlights. A greenhouse. He says, I heard the doctor was having people over for dinner, so I dug up some of the uh, harvestables and uh, brought them over a gift from neighbor to neighbor. Sounds like you got your own little slice of heaven over there. Oh, indeed, he says, a slice of heaven, and I'm very thankful to the good Lord for it. He smiles, and then realizing that no one's taken his hand, he just lowers it, shoves it back into the pocket of his coat, and he says, well, y'all have a good night, friends and lady, he turns to Trixie, doing a little bow on the porch. And then, Ooh, yep, go ahead, Lynx. Thank you. Good evening, sir. He nods, and then he turns, silently makes his way past you, crossing the road and returning to his little single-story house across the street. And then you stand on the porch of Dr. Earl's house. You're here in time for dinner. Well, if he's not aware that you've arrived he certainly will be now and sure enough the door flings itself open and there he is eugene earl on the other side dressed in his sunday best which isn't that different from what he usually wears he's still wearing that tweed academic jacket over a woolen vest that he always wears the only thing is he's added a bow tie to his collar to signify the occasion. Chambers, Buck, Trixie, he says, holding out his hands. You made it. Come in, come in. Angel's been here for quite some time. She's, uh, doing her thing. <laughs> oh, is she now? Oh, okay. You're, uh, you're Buck looking good. takes his hand. <laughs> He shakes your hand each in turn and then he leads you off the porch into his house, carefully shutting the door behind him. And as he leads you through the entrance hall, you notice that there's something uncanny about this house. It looks like it hasn't been lived in. There's not a speck of dust anywhere. And as you walk past the living room, you see that the sofa, the couches, uh, and even a bookshelf are still covered in sheets of plastic. He leads you into the dining room and you half expect the dining table to be covered under a sheet, but no, here it is. It's been set up for dinner. The plates and cutlery have already been arranged candelabra in the middle of the table burns bright illuminating the room with flickering candlelight and sitting opposite you pouring through a ratty looking deck of tarot cards each one covered in what looks to be a mixture of dirt scuff marks and fire damage is angel she barely seems to register your presence as you step into the room. She just draws another card, looks at it, and says, Hmm, the Lord is calling out and has a servant, a servant close by. Most, most interesting. And yet, 
a spirit caught between this realm and the next? Hmm. I don't know what to make of it. She shuffles the deck, and then she looks up, raises a hand in greeting. Evening, Angel. Uh, but Seems like you're still in your good old spirits. She just nods and she says, <laughs> Yes, speaking of the spirits, I found myself bombarded by them for the last two weeks. Ever since we cleansed that house, the spirits have been drawn to me like a beacon and all oh, the things they say to myself, Angel Christ, the wisdom they provide to myself and my flock. You need only listen, you know. Is that so? Well, I suppose you'd be loving the attention at the moment, then. Indeed, she says. I have been striving for this attention my entire life. Looking back at my ancestors, the Blackwoods, I have yearned for the power they once held, and now that I have opened my mind to the world beyond, it is coming to me. The spirits are flowing to me, and I can hear their voices, and they say they will have a purpose for us, all of us, very soon. Oh. That's well, I'm glad you're... You're happy and things seem to be going well for you. She turns away, looking back down at her deck of cards, her various beads and jewels jingling. And then Dr. Earl comes shuffling into the room from the kitchen beyond. He's holding a plate laden with, with, with fresh vegetables. He lays them down in the centre of the table and he says these are courtesy of bernard my new neighbor take your seats dish out some salad i'll be back in a moment with the main course and then he turns heads back into the kitchen and as he steps through the door for the briefest moment you catch the aroma of spices of a chicken roasting to perfection uh, Buck's going to turn off his face and uh, sniff the air. Yep, sniff the air. Something smells good. Let's change your paces on it, everyone. Yeah, not so fighting for your life for once. It's a Trixie. Yeah, I'd rather be wrestling with a roast chicken than a ghost. <laughs> so, Trixie, you grab the set of tongs and the bowl in front of you, start to dish out some salad onto your plate, and as you do, I'd like you to make a spot hidden check for me, please. Yeah, that really? one's over. <laughs> that is a... Wait. Help if I roll the D100. Yes, that'll help. That is double zero. That's a hundred, isn't it? Yeah. Look. Hundred fifteen. So that's a fail. <laughs> that's a fail. Look, you can tell that these this salad is luscious. You, you, the tongs grab half a tomato, lift it out of the bowl, and drop it onto your plate. The skin is deep crimson. There's droplets of water running down the outside. It is fresh, ripe, and of an unusually large size. <laughs> do you guys dish yourselves out some salad just the same if you do you can make a spot hidden check before you even call for the spot hidden check i was gonna have chambers be like carefully inspecting the food because yeah. he's very on he's edge paranoid anyway. by this point yeah it can't yeah. be just a social call right mm. uh, buck is going to be um kind of rifling with the tongs and scooping up some salad but mostly out of courtesy, he's not much of a greens person. <laughs> yeah. Um, I failed by four, and I'm going to push. Go ahead. Um, yeah, okay, I failed even harder that time. Uh, so what's the roll to check, sorry? It's just spot hidden. Spot hidden. Um, let's see. Um, that is a fail, 96. Yeah. It's... it's the, the 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 salad is incredibly fresh. It's it's as if as if 
these were a farmer's prize winning harvest. And for a moment, you find yourselves wondering how Bernard was able to just grow these in a vegetable patch behind his house. If any of you have natural world, you may go ahead and roll that. Uh, uh, I do not. I've got 10%. No, nah, if you don't, default, so. you only have the default, I won't allow it. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> that's fine, though. Is anyone game to take a bite? I think Chambers is, like, looking around at everybody else before he does. You see Angel uh, stick a fork. I don't think anything, but he won't eat it. Yep, you see Angel just stick a fork into a piece of tomato, lift it up, and crunch her teeth over it. She chews it, and then she looks back at you and smiles and says, Mmm, it tastes really nice. This is such bad news. Um, <laughs> Trixie? <laughs> Trixie, are you game enough to take a bite? Oh, one sec, she's having a bit of lag. Ah, uh, yeah, she's having some lag. That's okay. Oh, uh, what the heck. Uh, Buck's, yes. Buck's going to be um, neighbourly and uh, courteous and have a go of the salad. <laughs> yep. So Buck, cut a piece of tomato off, wrap it around some lettuce, stick it into your mouth and crunch. The crunch echoes through the dining room as you bite down on... But the lettuce is normal what you'd expect from a supermarket, but the tomato is bursting with flavour and juices. You've never tasted anything quite like this before, if I'm quite honest. it Whatever fertiliser Bernard uses, he's nailed down the way to grow... Perhaps the best tomatoes that you've tasted in your life. Uh, Buck's going to be shocked that he's enjoying a vegetable and um, just kind of proclaim, if he's got a green thumb, I, I think he's more got like an entire green hand. These are fantastic. <laughs> the All right, at this point, Chambers will relent to social pressure and just have some. Yep. So Chambers and Trixie exchange glances and then they nibble into the salad and your mouths burst with flavour. Whatever, what you were eat, whatever you've eaten in the past was clearly not the real thing. This is the real thing and it seems that Bernard lives across the road from someone who is a master of their craft has grown these exquisite morsels. At this point, the kitchen door opens and Dr. Earl emerges, his hands weighed down by a big silver plate upon which sits a magnificent roast bird. He places it down in the middle of the table, grabs the big knife, that's sticking out of its back and begins to carve it up, dishing out the roast for each of you. And then, in spite of yourselves, in spite of everything that's happened, you allow yourselves to simply enjoy the evening. You tuck in. Dr. Earl is a magnificent cook. This is some of the... This is one of the best roasts you've eaten in your life, and the... The vegetables provided by the man across the road add to it, turning this into a purely exquisite meal. Just as you're finishing up, about 20 minutes later, stacking up your plates and getting ready to hand them back to Eugene Earl, you hear the sound of tyres, car tyres, crunching on gravel from outside. Earl immediately looks up, his head whirls around and his gaze fixates on the window that looks out onto the street. And he says, ah, Bernard's back from his trip downtown. Come over here a second. He motions for you all to join him at the window. 
Uh, Buck's going to untuck, um, untuck his napkin from uh, from his collar and kind of throw it on the table uh, celebratorily and uh, jump up. Angel yeah. draws a card from the deck and she says, hmm, the spirits are about to speak. Trixie, Chambers, will you join Buck and Earl at the window? Yeah, but Chambers eyes Angel on the way. <laughs> Tell him to hold it for a minute. We've got company. It can't be rude. Angel rolls her eyes and she says, Oh, the spirits do not care for the formalities of man. But she gets up nonetheless, joins the rest of you at the window. And there, looking out the window, you notice the neighbour, Bernard, park his automobile in front of his house across the street unaware that you're all gathered around the window watching him. He exits the car and pops open the trunk, withdrawing from it two objects wrapped in canvas. One of the objects is small and round, the other approximately the size and shape of a baseball bat. Sticking the long object under his arm and clutching the smaller round one in his left hand... He begins to carry them up the path to the front door of his house and then holding both objects under one arm while he he begins to struggle with the stubborn lock. The larger of the two packages slides loose and falls down to the front porch with a resounding plop. The canvas folds fall open and you glimpse something white and cylindrical lying in the gloom outside. I'd like each of you to make a spot hidden roll for me, please. Um, oh, damn it, I missed by like six this time I'm pushing. Go ahead. I passed. Just a pass there. Um, I failed, but I'm going to push as well. Go ahead. And I passed. Oh, you um, all passed? Oh, that's a zero. Like a yeah, yeah, incredible. you all passed. You feel your jaws drop. The object lying on the porch appears to be the severed hand and fingers of a small child. Glancing around quickly to assure himself no one watches, Bernard bends down, quickly wraps the item up in canvas, and then, after successfully unlocking the door, disappears into his house. I'd like you all to make a sand check, please. Yeah, um, fail. Um, that's also a fail. Ooh. That is a pass. Apparently I've seen yeah. severed hands. Well, Trixie, you do taxidermy, <laughs> so you're you're fine with severed limbs. So you lose no sand, but Chambers and Buck, you each lose 1d3. One 1d3. One Let's see. That's true, okay. Chambers, you wouldn't happen to see things like that in your line of work, would you? That wasn't what I think it is. Yeah, that's, uh, that don't look right to me. Dr. Uh, Earl. At least two. Dr. Earl nods. He bites his bottom lip, points out the window, and he says, just keep watching. A moment later, a light appears in a basement window, quickly blunted by a hastily drawn shade. Go ahead and make listen checks for me, please. I'm so fucking normal anymore. Uh... Oh, I passed, surprisingly. Uh, I failed. Uh, failed. Failed? So, Chambers, you hear faintly coming from the basement window of Bernard's house, a strange gurgling sound <laughs> mixed with the occasional crackle of electricity. I like that. Happy that you've do witnessed... You this onto us? Yeah, do you, do you say you can um, hear? Honestly, I, I think that he doesn't. He just sort of acknowledges that he's just heard acknowledges something. acknowledges that it's there. Just the same. Dr. Earl seems happy that you've seen what... You now realise he invited you here 
to witness. He smiles, gestures towards the house across the road, and he says, Well, I confess, this was not just a social call. Never is. Moved in as soon as I heard who lives on this street. Now, as far as the neighbors would know, if you asked them, Bernard Corbett's always been a quiet, inoffensive, and normal man. He's a little bit absent-minded. But look at his estate. The lawn is immaculate, and he grows some exquisite vegetables. Uh, Buck is going to groan and uh, rub his, uh, in between the bridge of his nose uh, with his fingers. Corbett, of course. Earl nods. He says, look, uh, I couldn't help myself. I looked into the name, and turns out our old Mr. Corbett's got a great... got a, a grandson. Still lives in Boston, and you've met him. So I, uh, when I learned this house was up for lease, I leased it immediately. I've been keeping a watch over the guy. Look, he's quite well respected around here. Prominent businessman and everyone's friend, if the neighbors are, be to, are to be believed. He, uh, goes to work nine to five downtown every day, but every Sunday and Wednesday night, he leaves, goes off somewhere in the evening, he's gone for about an hour, comes back, and every time he's carrying, well, you saw with your own eyes. Fuck size. Guess the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Oh, we're in for some serious headaches. Earl nods. He says, now, I want to find out what he's doing in that basement. I want to find out just how connected he is with his granddad's old schemes and the Chapel of Contemplation. You've seen it for yourselves now, and I can tell you want to know the answers too, right? Obviously, but we've, we've got opposite chambers here. Surely this is enough reason for a warrant to search the man now. Yeah, yeah, it is. Earl. I'm just going to quickly uh, yep. step over and uh, <laughs> jostle chambers in the ribs a little bit. Hey, you brought your badge with you, right? Yep. Yeah, I did. Earl shrugs. He says, well, if you think that's the way to proceed, go ahead. I, I was hoping maybe the Bureau could do something. Look, we're just a little club. We don't have much in the way of actual jurisdiction so if you can pull some strings if you think there's something going on over there i mean you all saw what dropped out of that bundle then maybe that's what needs to be done look i mean yeah it depends how much formality we want to follow but i wouldn't say this is really any natural paranormal things we can handle he stacks up all the plates and then he nods and he says as far as we know, Guy's just a wacko. Chopping up people, taking body parts into his basement, doing something with them. But we know who his grandfather, grandfather is, and we know the types of things the Chapel of Contemplation was caught up in. So we've got to assume there's probably something unexpected going on. Now, I've done a bit of research on the guy. He's the son of... Theodore Corbett, Walt Corbett's son, who founded the small but very successful Corbett Importers of America. Bernard owns the business now, took it over about 14 years ago when his dad died in an accident in South America, I believe. He was married once. He's currently a widower. Uh, what I've heard from the neighbors is his wife's been dead at least a dozen years. But I'm not sure I believe everything I've heard. I just want to know what's happening. And, well, knowing what we're up against, I'd advise you to approach this with some care. Now... 
if you head down to the li local library, I'm sure you can find all the information you need about Corbett's father and the untimely death of his wife. But I also happen to find through one of my contacts that he's been regularly meeting with an orderly down at Central Hospital. A guy that goes by the name of Randolph Tomaszewski. Now, I'm not sure why he's meeting with this guy, but he meets him on his lunch hour at least two or three times a week. And I got a feeling there's something going on there as well. He carries the plates into the kitchen, and then he emerges about 30 seconds later, rubs his hands together, and he says, Well, <laughs> that was a lovely dinner. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And, well, now you've seen what I invited you over here to see, and I'll let you handle it however you feel you should. After all, you've been the guys and gals out there on the ground putting your lives at risk. <laughs> this is all yeah, academic to me. Dead. Yep. I feel that you should tag along with us. Come on, give you a police escort. He rolls his eyes. Go ahead and make a persuade check for me, please, Chambers. <laughs> sure, that's, um... Lack of suicide vision. <laughs> <laughs> that's a pass. Pass. He rolls his eyes and he says... Ah, uh, I mean, okay, look, <laughs> police escort, I, I can't turn that down. Look, I was going to put you all up for the night in this house. There's some bedrooms upstairs that are ready for you. I was going to suggest, you know, first thing tomorrow morning, we hit the town, start to canvas the old newspapers, ask some questions, figure out what's going on with this Tomaszewski guy. But if you want to pay... Mr. Corbett, a visit now. See what he has to say for himself. I'll tag along. What do you reckon, folks? Uh, you can see the um, the kind of gears turning behind Sam's eyes, and he gets a glint for a moment. Okay. Just come up with a plan. Now you say he does this every single day, right? Leaves for work nine in the morning. Comes back five. Every Sunday and Wednesday, heads into town, comes back with those little bundles of joy. Here's what I'm thinking. We shack up here at the night. We spend tomorrow doing some research. And tomorrow, while he's out, we all sneak in. And, uh, Mr. Earl, if you could play, uh, Mr. Sneaky Man and, uh, keep him distracted when he comes home. Uh, to ensure we get out, we can pull this off and without a hitch. Can do, says the doc. I've been hitting him up for, uh, you know, tips how to grow those fantastic tomatoes, and he's a little coy, but, <laughs> well, I should be able to stall for at least a few minutes. I think that's all we'll need. If he's gone for an hour, spend that time digging around. See what's in that basement of his. Claps his hands together. He says, all right, well, all right, Chambers and Buck, I'm sorry. You two are shacking up together. Upstairs, first room on the left. Trixie, you got the one on the right, and I'll be in the master bedroom down the end. Angel wants to sleep down here. She, uh, Angel cuts him off and says, I commune better with the spirits on my own. Yeah, I bet you do. Well, don't stay up talking all night now, dearie. <laughs> you rest up too. Earl says, Well, oh, look, it's uh, nearly eight o'clock. Been burning the candle on both ends. I might retire. Uh, nightcap, anyone? Please. Uh, Buck is going to lick his lips. <laughs> <laughs> Eugene carries a bottle of whiskey out from the kitchen as he begins to pour you all a shot. He winks and he says, uh, Agent Chambers, no telling anyone about this <laughs> little bottle here. And then... Lips is sealed. 
then he carries it away, raises his... When he returns, he grabs his shot glass, raises it, and says, To good health! And then downs it. I mean, we keep it beyond tomorrow night. <laughs> good point, he says. Now, I'll be in the master bedroom if you need me. Try not to, uh, play all your cards. Let's, let's try to keep, uh, Mr. Corbett out of the loop until we absolutely have to bring him in. Night, y'all, he says as he shuffles out of the room and makes his way upstairs. Uh, Buck is going to put his hand around um, uh, Chambers' shoulder. Now, I think I got a brand new ghost story I haven't told you yet. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've actually taken quite a shining to them since, uh, since our last engagement. The shining? <laughs> yeah, the <a> shining. <laughs> hey. <laughs> so, is there anything you'd like to do before you get ready for bed? Uh, consider my life choices. <laughs> <laughs> that said, um, are we feeling yep. strange at all? No, you're vegetables? not feeling strange. They appear to just have been ordinary vegetables, but after you've seen what you've seen, <laughs> you would be forgiven for feeling just a little bit of paranoia. I mean, I did half joke to myself while we're, while we're eating that surely the fertilizer was dead bodies, but I really <laughs> hope that isn't the case now. Yeah. Chambers, Actually, you do... Buck's gonna, um, yep, go ahead, Buck. Uh, Buck's going to quickly uh, pace out to the front room and look out the window again, like pull across the drapes and have a quick peek to see if you can see anything across the road. Yeah, go ahead, make a spot hidden check. Ooh. Okay. Uh, 32. That's a, that's a fail by seven. It's a fail. So at this point, you notice that the light in the basement appears to have been turned off. Corbett's house across the road is dark and silent, and you can see no signs of life coming from his property. Uh, Buck's going to shrug and um, uh, pull across the drape and uh, head back to the others. So, Chambers, as a federal agent, you are aware that well, you've sighted human remains and you've got at least two witnesses. You would be able to call in call in some of your friends from the bureau to come and ask a few questions if you'd like to play your hand early. Uh, that's going to make shit worse. I was going to say, I think Earl was warning against that. This Bernard Corbett, according to Earl at least, is a pretty well-liked man. He's a pillar of the community. And as you briefly consider calling up the Bureau and getting some men down here to search the house, you almost see in your mind's eye Mr. Corbett jovially turning them away with a basket of his exquisite tomatoes as a gift as they apologise him for wasting his time. Yeah, and then evidence gets destroyed. And so, you bid each other good night, climb up, climb up the stairs and make your way to bed. The accommodations are sparse. They're not even beds. It appears that Eugene only brought in enough furniture to complete the facade down on the ground floor. The bedrooms are completely empty, save for some mattresses just thrown on the carpet for you to collapse onto. But that's fine. You're not getting much restful sleep these nights anyway. And so, after tossing and turning and trying to shake away images of spindly, multi-limbed, extra-dimensional insects and emaciated corpses rising from tables to attack you, 
you find yourselves waking up as the grey early morning light pierces the windows. You look over at a clock that's been hung on the wall outside in the hallway. It's just after 7am. Mr. Corbett will be leaving work within the hour. Our gentlemen, I suppose we're going to make the most of this time. We have get cracking now. But I out, see what we can scout around the place until he leaves, and then say maybe one group heads to the library and one group heads to somewhere else we need to be. See what we can get done before he gets home. Just as right. well, says Earl, making his way out of the master bedroom, still wearing his night clothes. I'll cook us up some eggs and bacon, and we can see if we see anything strange while we eat. Come on. Seems rather jovial, considering the circumstances. You're in good spirits, Earl. He shrugs. Well, uh... <laughs> I, uh... I've been bitten by that bug, you know. I gotta know what's going on, and, well, if I'm honest with you, there's no place I'd rather be. He leads you downstairs, and you see it around the table. Angel's still seated there. She doesn't appear to have moved all night. She just looks up at you as you approach, and she says, The spirits will let you talk to them today. I've been told, anyway. Gotta play it careful. Some of them don't like too many questions. She slides a card back into her deck, and Earl brings out plates of bacon, eggs, and sausages. And while you eat them, you take turns peering out the window to see if you see anything interesting. I'd like each of you to make a spot hidden check if you'd like to take your spot at the window. That's a pass. Absolutely. Let's see. Let's uh, That's a fail, but I'll push it. Let's see how it goes. Uh, that's still Are a fail. It's still a fail. Still a fail. Still okay. fail. So, Chambers, you're the only one who manages to catch anything during your spot, peering out the window. Gets to just before 8 a.m., and Bernard Corbett makes his appearance, strolling down the front path towards his car to make his way to work. And you notice that he did not emerge from his house, but rather from the greenhouse that you can just make out beyond his abode. And as he slides into the front seat of his car... He holds in his left hand what appears to be an empty burlap sack, roughly the right size to contain more macabre prizes similar to the one you saw him bring home last night. Yeah, it looks like he's up to the uh, same old, same old. You watch as he reverses his car out from the driveway and once he's on the street... He looks over in the direction of Bernard, of Earl's house. Go ahead and make a stealth check for me, please, uh -oh. Chambers. Um, or hide, yeah, rather. Cute. Stealth or hide, uh, whichever one. Or, or hide, okay. Um, Actually, I don't think hide's in this edition. So, yeah, it's just hides. stealth. Uh, fail, pushing. Fail. Fail. He sees you staring out the window at him. And he flashes you a smile, raises his hand in greeting, and then turns back towards the steering wheel and drives down the street, turning left at the end and disappearing behind the house on the corner. That might not be good. <laughs> ah, don't think too much of it, Chambers, says Earl. You were just looking out the window. <laughs> There's no way you'd know what he's up to. Uh, I hope. Well, uh, we'll 
guys headed off to work, so, uh, now we get to work. <laughs> so, here's how I see it. Someone can go hit up the library, see if we can find out anything about his background, what he's been doing since his grandfather passed away and left us at that mess you cleaned up two weeks ago. Maybe someone might head to the hospital, see what this Tomazuski guy's got to do with anything. And, hell, if you're game enough, I'll accompany one of you over to across the street, see if we can't uh, find anything while the cat's away. Three groups, three tests. Seems pretty clear to me. You fine with hey. it? He says. Oh, does he ever come home from work, really? Always home at five on the dot. Never has come home early that I've seen. Guy's a creature of right. habit. All right, you're coming with me. We're crossing the road. Oh, sure, I I'm up for it, he says. He looks over at Buck and Trixie and Angel sitting at the table. He says, all right, before I go, I got to know uh, who's handling the other leads. Suppose I'll head back to the library again. I'm starting to get a bit more familiar with how this layout is and all this shifty information gets hidden. I hear you're a regular there, Miss Trixie. And Angel, you might go with her, seeing as how you seem to know uh, how to look for things that other people aren't quite used to finding. Angel nods and she says, I'll do my best. Now, Buck, I take it. You're volunteering to uh, see what's going on with the orderly down the hospital. Uh, Buck starts fiddling with a um, little pouch of tobacco, rolling up a cigarette. Yep, it's like you got a trip ahead of me. Chambers, can I borrow your car? If you leave so much as a scratch on it. How hard could it be? It's just like riding a horse, right? <laughs> what's your drive? By the way. Uh, <laughs> um, that's a good question. I don't think he has drive. No, he doesn't have drive. Yeah, okay. so it's just the base, which is <laughs> it, 20. It was mostly a joke. <laughs> oh, it'll be very hard. It's going to come back and with angel, please, don't. <laughs> and Angel, if I do miss a, some miss some information, please don't knock it upside my head again. Just tell me politely and I'll be sure to go back to it. Angel shrugs and <laughs> says, The spirits work in mysterious ways. <laughs> And then she begins to walk towards the entrance hall. Earl says, Buck, you bring that shooter of yours? Uh, <laughs> which one? So you got at least one. Good. All right. I was just, you know, having a feeling you might need it is all. All right, everyone, let's get to work. Best of luck. And uh, let's pull through this, okay? And then he leads you into the entrance hall, and Angel's already unlatching the front door, stepping out into the morning dampness outside. You join her on the porch as Earl shuts the door behind him. He looks into the faces of each of you, and you can't help but feel like your roles have reversed when... When this all started and Earl recruited you, he was the expert, but now, looking back at... He's seeing him look back at you, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed. You have a feeling he has no idea what he's about to step into. So, we will go first with... Trixie. So, Trixie... You follow Angel to her car... Angel's been driving... You've never seen what Angel drives before. This is the first time you've ever seen it. And, well, it stands out, that's for certain. It's a Model T Ford. But the black paint has been scraped away. And the outside... Scraped away in places. Patches here and there. And these... Patches where there's no paint have been filled in with all sorts of bizarre occult symbols drawn in glittering gold ink. The inside of the car is even worse. There's 
beads, talismans, and other pieces of jewelry hanging from the rear view mirror and attached to the steering wheel. Angel seems to notice none of this. She simply turns the key in the ignition and begins to carry you through the suburb of Lexington towards the library on the edge of downtown. Trixie, would you like to make a navigate check to see if you can help Angel save time on this journey? Sure thing, if I can navigate my character sheet, so we are. After all, you can get everything Jay. done before Corbett comes home from work. Is a... Us. Pass, yeah. So you've actually been spending quite a bit of time in the library of late as you've expanded your exhibits within the museum to account for more esoteric things. You've been spending a lot of time in the library reading up on cryptids and ancient folklore and the like. And you pull out the roadmap that's folded up in the glove compartment and deftly navigate Angel to the library what would have been a half hour journey is completed within 15 minutes, giving you some extra time to look around. And then you (laughs) step through the step past the Gothic style columns into the library and find yourself in the big open hall, staring at rows upon rows of thick bookshelves laden with the sum of mankind's knowledge. Angel looks at you and says, Well, what do you have in mind, Trixie? I suppose the main thing would be to find records of the deceased father and deceased spouse, see if there was any suspicious circumstances. Uh, what else? I suppose we'd need to research Randolph, would we? Trixie frowns and she says, Hmm, I'll take a look at a few things, see if anything springs to mind. And then she makes her way towards the books, her talismans and jewels jingling, and you catch sight of the librarian watching her from behind the counter. She seems to recognise you. She smiles, raises a hand in greeting, and she says, Miss Trixie, may I be of assistance today by any chance? Good morning, yes. I was wondering if you could help me. We are looking for records of a um, deceased family we're doing some research into. their Corbett's. Well, you've arrived early enough that uh, I haven't yet received any uh, pressing issues, so sure, I'll help you look, she says. And thanks to arriving so early, you have the librarian who's able to help you, so you may make a library use check, and you may make it with advantage, which is roll twice and take the lowest. I'm not used to hearing advantage in Call of Cthulhu. <laughs> yeah, well, luckily you got here before the librarian got bogged down on the day's work. That is a... Probably shouldn't get used to it. 40, 47, that is a fail. Yeah, just bad. You can push it, and it will be with advantage again if you push it. Oh, yeah, might as well push it. It's a pass. Pass. With the librarian's help, you access the old newspaper records at the back of the library, grab a couple of folders off the shelf, take them over to the reading table and begin to flick through them. And after f- after searching through these with Angel's help for about an hour or so, you eventually find some very useful information. The first is an article dated 14 years ago, The headline is, Local Businessman Killed in Accident. It reads, It was learned today that Theodore Corbett, owner of Corbett Importers of America, is dead, victim of a tragic accident while vacationing in India. Corbett, while in the company of his son Bernard, died in a fall while the two were travelling through the high mountains of the Punjab. According to authorities, the two men were on a hiking trip when they were set upon by a group of bandits known to frequent the area. 
while being pursued down the mountainside, the elder Corbett apparently lost his footing and fell to his death. His son managed to escape, eventually making it to safety. The elder Corbett's body has not yet been located, and authorities fear it may be lost, possibly consumed by the wild dogs that roam the mountain. Theodore Corbett is survived by his wife, Elaine, and one son, Bernard. This time, it is not known if Bernard Corbett will take over management of the family business. Exchange a look with the librarian as she flips a page on the folder and removes another newspaper clipping. These two articles that she produces are both dated 12 years ago. The first is an obituary for a Lynn Ann Myers Corbett, age 22. It reads, Died in childbirth in her home. A graduate of the Pierpont School, Mrs. Corbett was married to local businessman Bernard Corbett two years ago. Funeral services for both mother and child will be held Saturday afternoon. Mrs. Corbett is survived by her parents, Edward and Shirley Myers, and her husband, Bernard Corbett, president of Corbett Importers of America. The other article has an ominous headline, Nurse Hospitalised After Accident in Patient's Home. Professional nurse, Miss Mona Dunlap, was admitted to Danvers Sanitarium yesterday following an accident that took place in a patient's home. Her condition was diagnosed as serious. Miss Dunlap, hired by Mr. and Mrs. Bernard Corbett to help with Mrs. Corbett's confinement, apparently suffered a stroke while attempting to deliver the Corbett's baby unassisted. Mr. Corbett returned from his office Wednesday afternoon to find Nurse Dunlap unconscious and his wife and infant son dead due to complications arising from the birth. Doctors at the sanitarium say the woman has yet to regain consciousness and it may be some time before the full extent of her injuries are known. One final article, which appears to pique your interest, says... Local man arrested in animal slayings. It's from three months ago. It says, Police today announced that a suspect has been arrested in connection with the recent rash of pet kidnappings in the southwest part of town. Although released later for lack of evidence, Randolph Tomaszewski is considered the prime suspect in the recent disappearances of nearly a dozen dogs and cats from the homes and yards of the neighbourhoods surrounding Central Hospital. Tomaszewski is employed at the hospital as an orderly. It will be remembered that many of the missing pets have been discovered later in parks, usually mutilated or partially eaten. Public outcry over the atrocities has been strong, and police hope that they have uncovered a lead that will eventually allow them to close this case. Oh, that's some grisly things you'll be reading about today, Miss Trixie, says the librarian closing the folder she says is this museum work or are you uh doing a favor for that strange dr earl again well i would have to confess it is for earl but he's 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 got a new neighbor so he thought he'd look into him and see if he was you know the unsavory type and at the looks of this we might be having to keep an eye on ourselves but otherwise not too much into work just casual curiosity of he has asked us to do some looking into the librarian stacks the folders up and then she stands up out of her seat and she looks at you with a look of concern on her face and she says well you just be careful you hear last time you were helping out the good doctor, you hurt your leg, and you're still not walking the same. Oh, just adds character to my stride. <laughs> we'll, we'll do our best, but... A fine way of thinking of it, Miss Trixie. You have a good day now, she says. She turns, seeing a couple of patrons gathered around the front desk that she needs to attend to. Angel looks at you, Trixie, and she says, Hmm... The spirits are talkative today. Is there anything else we should look for? Um, do, do, do. One minute while I go for my notes. Mm, 
Du, 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 next event. Du, 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 No, I think that's all that I can think of. Shall we head to Danvers Sanitarium and speak to this, see if we can find out anything about this nurse, perhaps? It seems like the next best option. Let's be on our way then, says Angel. You can consult the road, spirits. You're rather good at it. Fancy the map. And as you make your way back to the car, we swap to Buck. Buck. Climb out of Chambers' car, slam the door shut behind you, and cross the already packed parking lot to stand in front of the entrance of Central Hospital. I'd like you to make a drive check just so we can see how long it took you to get here. How ruined my car is. <laughs> uh, I was going to say, um, <laughs> Buck would have definitely been smoking in your car, by the way. Oh. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, that is a 65. So that is just a regular old fail. Yep. You're still not as familiar with inner Boston as you li- you'd like to be. You've only been here for two weeks, but in that time, you've mainly focused on being able to find your way to and from your apartment and the local corner store. And so it takes you about 40 minutes to reach the hospital, putting you behind schedule, but hopefully there'll be enough here to make it worth your while. You push open the double glass doors and step into the hospital reception. It's almost empty. There's a mother with a child seated on one of the chairs. The child's holding a tissue to his nose covered in blood. Behind the reception desk is a mousy-faced woman covered in freckles with strawberry blonde hair. And as she sees you enter, she looks up from the typewriter and says, May I help you, sir? Uh, <laughs> I, w- I was planning on bringing something with me, but uh, I don't think I really had time with that driving. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was assuming yeah, your uh, rifle? <laughs> Pardon? I was assuming your rifle? Uh, no, actually, I was going to um, have him shuffle around in um, like the hard rubbish outside, like the um, recycling. Ah, so if you could yes. find a box or something you could bring mm. in. You you can, but perhaps you'll have to do it after this because you you took so much time to get it. here that when you arrived, you saw orderlies hanging around outside smoking cigarettes and got the feeling that you would probably be noticed if you decided to do it now. I never have time for things. It's drive too slow. Um, yeah, so, uh, Buck leans forward, uh, assertively. Yeah, uh, courier service. Uh, I got a package in my car for a, uh, Randall Tomaszewski. He looks at his hand as if he has a piece of paper on it. Uh, <laughs> Ma- where would I find him? Make a fast talk check for me, please. I just gotta fail so hard. Uh, Oh, no. Uh, hey, uh, can I use three luck to bring that yeah, to pass? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm going to do that. So that's, a, that's a pass. The mousy-haired woman looks at you and then she starts flipping through a book on the counter. And then she says, oh, she says, Mr. Tomaszewski's not in today. Uh, called in sick this morning. Uh, I can direct you to his office and maybe you can leave the package there unless you need him to sign it. No, I'll just get you to sign it on my way back. Oh, sure, she says. She says, okay, so uh, head through that door there, uh, past the nurse's station, turn left, and Tomaszewski's office should be right at the end. Uh... Word to the wise, when you step in there, uh, put your hand over your nose, because uh, 
She leans in, she says, Well, Randolph's um, main job here is uh, cleaning up the operating rooms, disposing of the rubbish, stuff like that. And, uh, well, he seems to carry the stench wherever he goes with him, and uh, his office has become something of a quagmire. Uh, Buck shakes his head uh, <laughs> with for understanding. Yeah, sucks to be stuck with janitorial work when you're trying to work your way up. You'll get there, though. Well, uh, if you need me, let me know, she says, and then she looks towards the son and the mother, and she says, uh, Mrs. Dunlop, you're, uh, the doctor said he should be on his way now. Um, you thank her for your time, step through the door beyond her, and follow her directions, and you can smell Tomaszewski's office before you reach it. It's right at the end of a hallway beyond the main patient wings, right at the back of the hospital, shoved out of the way so that most of the hospital staff would rarely need to be anywhere near it. And as you approach the door, the stench that's a mixture of rotting trash mud and old blood assaults your senses. Whew, she wasn't kidding. And I pinches his nose quite hard and opens his door with his opens the door with his non preferred hand. Reach forward, push open the door, taking note of the piece of paper taped to it, reading Keep out me only. Tomaszewski and you step into the gloom on the other side the inside of the office is dark there is no window and the stench is even stronger in here uh, is there a light he can flick on or something just to get a better look yeah make a luck check for me Ooh. okay let's see um, wait, where is my luck at the moment uh, there it is. Okay, let's see. Uh, nope, that's a fail. Fumble around, patting the wall around the door, hoping to find a light switch, but there's nothing there. And so, you hold your breath and step into the quagmire and start to search. Go ahead and make a spot hidden check, but it will be in order to find anything, you will need a hard success. Ooh, alright. Okay. <sighs> Dice called stone. Oh, that's a very big fail. That's a 95. <laughs> would you uh, like to push? Yeah, I would very much like to push that. Uh, that's a hard pass, 11. Ooh, lovely. In spite of there seemingly being no light, and indeed you look up and you see the light socket on the roof is empty, the globe's been pulled out, you make your way into the office to a big bulky square that you quickly determine is Tomaszewski's desk and start rifling through the stacks of papers and cardboard boxes that are piled high upon it. When you shift all of this clutter away... You see something peculiar, seemingly carved into the surface of the desk. You run your hands over it, trying to confirm that it is indeed what you think it is. It's a pentagram, an occult pentagram carved right into the desk. Oh boy, that ain't good. So Buck remembers um, from their previous experience having sigils and such on the floor. Yeah. It's his, uh, his skin is down on end. The stench of old blood seems to grow even stronger as you lean towards this sigil. And as you squint, you make out dark stains on the sides of some of the grooves. You shiver. Hopefully that's not human blood. You quickly rifle through all the papers and cardboard boxes. Most of it's just roster sheets, time sheets, records of 
when trash has been taken out, when garbage, when things have been taken to the garbage dump and in what quantities. But there's one piece of paper, a folded up, folded up sheet of bright yellow paper that slides out of a manila folder. It lands almost coincidentally right in the centre of the pentagram. You unfold it and bring it close to your face so that you can see it. And this is what it says. Try to decipher the handwriting. It reads, Sunday, four cats, one dog, left arm, girl, seven years. Wednesday, two dogs, liver, boy, 11 years, right arm, boy, nine years, meet with Corbett at garbage dump as usual. Mm, the pieces fall into place. Uh, so Buck is going to uh, uh, find that the stench becomes slightly more overwhelming uh, than he found it before, and uh, quickly tuck this uh, under his shirt into his pants um, so that he can like uh, pull his jacket and shirt over it so nobody will notice him taking it out. Lovely. And as you tuck it away and begin to move once more towards the entrance, you see, right next to the door, a cork board that you didn't notice when as you came in, as your back was turned to it. And here, there's a bundle of notes covering every inch of the cork board. Most of them appear to be innocuous, but you shudder as you read one of them pinned in the upper right corner. It simply reads... Hail Satan, and then spare key under doormat. Keep okay. goods in freezer until until Corbett calls. Ooh, uh, Buck is going to commit that to memory. Um, would he be able to infer that this is for Corbett's house or for Brandolph's house? It seems to be... It se you can make an intelligence check, actually. Uh, let's see. Um, that's, a, that's a fail. It seems, seems to be a note left by Tomaszewski to himself, possibly reminding him to store whatever goods he's not ready to give to Corbett in his own house but it could also be referring to Corbett's house you're not entirely sure uh Buck's going to become uh, quite aware that uh, the receptionist is probably uh going to be getting wary since he hasn't come back yet and uh start to uh kind of tidy himself up and uh clean things up you place the cardboard boxes and the piles of paper back on the desk and then make your way back to reception. The mousy-faced woman looks up from the typewriter. She smiles. Did you find did, did you find the office okay, sir? Uh, Buck is going to attempt to uh, con her once again. Yeah, uh, I thought I might leave the package there, but I left it in my car, and, uh... Man, it's a dump site in there. You said it was working from home today, right? Uh, I might as well just drop past this place. I don't have any other jobs today. Uh, what, what's his address? She thinks for a moment. Go ahead, make a fast talk check. Oh god, let's see if this works. Uh, definitely not. 75. She says, hmm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I feel right just uh, giving his address. Uh, I'm sure you could come back tomorrow, maybe, or... She tries to think of an alternate, an alternate solution, but in the end, she just shakes her head. She says, "No, I, I'm sure Mr. Tomaszewski would be quite upset if I just uh, gave a stranger his uh, his address. Is it really that important? I just don't want him to miss out on something if it's so important to him. That's all." Uh, yeah, Buck's gonna push it. Um, yeah, I mean, you know what they say about, uh, 
snow nor hail nor shine nor uh whatever he clearly doesn't know the saying yeah <laughs> he clearly uh, doesn't know i gotta it. i really should uh get this to him myself go ahead make another fast talk check all right let's see how it goes this is not buck specialty uh 58 no that's no no deal do you like to spend luck? I might as well, might as well push it. Um, oh, yep, or oh, you can push it. Go why ahead. not? How, how, how much worse can it be? Uh, 94. Mm. <laughs> the woman just frowns and she says, Well, you know what? Now that I think about it, you're not dressed how a postman is dressed at all. And... Look, I'm going to be writing it down right here that you were asking about, Mr. Tomaszewski. When he comes in tomorrow, he can uh, try to get in touch with you himself if he thinks it's that important. <laughs> oh, Buck has been way over his head. Thanks, this, is, this is not his wheelhouse. He shoots things. Um, <laughs> whew, uh, Buck is going to scramble on his feet and try and um, reassure her that he does, in fact, work for like a courier service of some kind. Let's say, uh, so you, I'll go get my ID from the car. I'll be right back. I'd and, like. Um, yep. You're going to try it. Yeah. <laughs> He's going to try and just hightail it out of there. You turn around, and as you turn to leave, saying you're going to get your ID, I would like you to please make for me a persuade check. Ooh, on some that's not going to go great either. I should have said, should have said, oh, James James for this one. Uh, oh, fantastic, nine. So you sort of turn around in a huff. Well, no, I, I mustn't have my ID on me. I'll be back in a moment, miss. You just, you turn around and you hear her giggle. And she says, oh, please don't think anything of it. I... I just, you know, you folks were all usually in uniform, but with a reaction like that, you gotta be with the service. She says, all right, look, he's on the corner of 6th and 7th Street, apartments in that building there, and I believe he's in room 201. Fantastic. You've been incredibly, incredibly helpful. And um, he quickly pats his jacket and um, like dusts off his duster a little bit, says, I'm from the Special Horse Division. She just smiles and she says, I have put it on the record that you've been here, so Mr. Tomaszewski will see it and the directors will check this at the end of the day. So I uh, hope that doesn't cause you any inconvenience. Someone might end up contacting you tomorrow just to figure out what the purpose of your visit was, but... Well... Uh, Buck is acutely aware he has not given her any personal information whatsoever, not even his name. Yeah. And he just nods and says, no problem, miss. You have a good day now. You too. She smiles. Step outside and... I'd like you to make a luck check, please. Um, 24, that's a success. I 24. think it's a hard success, if yeah. there's a hard success for luck. Yeah, there is a hard success. So as you're strolling back to the parking lot, your eyes turn to the little meeting area around the side of the hospital, hospital where the orderlies were gathered just a few minutes ago, taking the first of many breaks throughout the day. And... It's now completely empty. There are several dumpsters lined up against the brick wall. And at least one of them has a sign taped to it that states biological waste only. Ooh, Buck is going to definitely notice that and go have a quick poke around uh, before he hops back in up. Uh... Chambers, fantastic car. Sure. I'd like you to make... Start. As you uh, begin to approach the quad area, you become acutely aware that there's a row of windows on the second floor of the hospital that provide a direct view of you if anyone were to be looking. 
You can't see anyone, but if you'd like to be careful, you can make a stealth check. Otherwise, you can just approach as per normal. I'll make a stealth check. Stealth is something that he can do. Um, nope, that's a fail. I'm going to push that. How bad can it be? I say the second time tonight. Uh, 40, 42. Can I, uh, can I use luck? You sure on, can. On pushes? You sure can. Uh, I'll just spend two luck on that just to bring it down to success. Pressing up against the base of the hospital wall, you creep into the quad, approach the nearest dumpster, and as you open it, your senses are once again assaulted by that stench from Tomaszewski's office. Inside the dumpster, you can make out bags of biological waste, Things that have been removed, obst obstructions from inside people's intestines, peeled skin, old syringes and the like. And you see an imprint in the dust at the bottom of the dumpster. It's roughly the size of your arm, indicating that there was something there but it's gone. Ooh, would it happen to be about the size and length of the um, things that um, Corbett bought back yesterday? Yeah, roughly the same size. Mm, very interesting. Uh, Buck is going to make a mental note of that as well uh, to tell the others. And uh, quietly and quickly, um, just Trying not to make the dumpster squeak too much, just bring the lid down and sidestep himself away. Seems Tomazuski is stealing amputated limbs. To what end? Creep back out of the quad, and soon enough you're on the edge of the parking lot. You don't feel like anyone's seen you. You hope that's the case. As you make your way towards Chamber's vehicle, what's going to be your next move? It is... By now, it is just after 10.30 a.m. Ooh, um... Tomaszewski's address is on the corner of 6th and 7th of something. Um, how far away is that from here? Assuming I'm you're able to find your... There. Assuming you don't waste any time, it should be about a 10, 15 minute journey. Ooh. Yeah, Buck's definitely going to quickly stop past there um, before See he reconvenes he with the others. Very well. We now cross... And he's also going to quickly roll another cigarette for the car. Yeah, you roll another cigarette, take the puff just as you slide into the driver's, side, dri driver's seat. Go ahead and make a drive check for me, please. No problems. Um, that's a 25. That's almost a pass. Mm. Do you want to spend luck or push it? Um, oh, I've got plenty of luck. I'll just spend five and bring it down. Yep. I have 51 luck. All right. So you'll make it just in... You'll make it on time. We now cross to Chambers. Chambers, you stand on the porch of Eugene's rental property, staring at Corbett's tiny shack-like single-story home on its huge grassy lot the greenhouse beyond it towering over it dwarfing the actual house and eugene earl looks at you he's got a strange smile on his face and he says so uh, i take it you've done this before <laughs> where to first Chambers, you might be muted. Yes, I am. Uh, what I said was, uh, well, we could start with the front door, or we could take a look at that greenhouse. Uh, Eugene chuckles, and he says, well, part of me is curious to find out how he manages to grow those damn tomatoes. But I guess we got more pressing issues to attend to first. But... You said you saw him coming out of there before he left to work this morning, didn't you? Yeah, I did, and uh, 
I have a sneaking suspicion those tomatoes are related. I'll leave it up to you, he says. This ain't my wheelhouse, but I'll follow your every word. Well, chances are greenhouse is less gadded, so uh, let's start there. Yeah, right on, he says. You lead him across the road, trudge up the path leading to Corbett's house, and then walk beyond it going around the side of the house and emerging in Corbett's huge backyard. Here, the big glass structure of the greenhouse towers above you, makes you feel minuscule, and... The greenhouse itself is perhaps bigger than Corbett's actual house. Beyond the glass, you can see that the place is filled with abundant greenery, plants of all different shapes and sizes. There's thick plant cover around the perimeters of the greenhouse, preventing you from seeing what's going on inside, unless you enter through a conveniently ajar metal doorway just a little bit further down the path ahead of you. Beyond that, you can also see what must be Corbett's veggie patch. There's a section of earth about five feet by five feet that's been dug up and there are wooden sticks poking out of the earth. Vines coiled around them are full of juicy, ripe tomatoes. Perhaps not quite as big or as fresh as the ones you ate last night, but getting there. A shovel is lying discarded to the side of the veggie patch. Oh, you know much about agriculture? Earl shrugs. I'd like you to make a luck check, please. Yeah, sure. That's, um... Oh, God. Uh, there, right. Uh, critical. Earl shrugs. He says, <laughs> you know, uh... In my undergrad days, I did happen to take a minor in horticulture. Maybe some of the old knowledge might float up out of my noggin once we get in there. All right, I want you to take a look at that uh, little garden patch over there. I'm going to go take a look at this uh, this door. And he's going to head to the conveniently ajar door, and he's going to be looking out for anything sus around that immediately, because that's... Yep. Uh, concerning. <laughs> You're going to be right on your own, says Eugene, as he hoists up the shovel and begins to dig it into the earth. Chambers doesn't respond. Chambers steps through the doorway and into the greenhouse. Chambers, as you step into the greenhouse, I'd like you to make a power check, please. Ooh, okay. That's uh, a fail. Can I push? You can push. Ooh, uh, AC against AC. Lovely. As you step beyond the threshold, you feel the hairs on the back of your neck rise. That that danger sense that you've honed particularly well over the last few months is alerting you that something is terribly wrong in here. Inside the greenhouse... There's tens, no, hundreds of different varieties of plants, most of them green, but some in various other colours, flowers of all sorts of vibrant shades, the scent of fresh earth and morning dew fills your nostril, and you swear the moment you step into the greenhouse that some of the plants rustle as if registering your presence. That's so bad. Um, can I spot anything immediately interesting? So you may go ahead and make a natural world check or a spot hidden check. Oh, definitely spot hidden. Um, pass. Pass. Step further into the greenhouse and despite the fact that it's made of glass it's almost like the sunlight grows dimmer the plant cover the vines and creepers that 
grow across the inside walls of the greenhouse seem to blot out the sun your hand on the hilt of your gun you look around trying to see something anything of interest and then you see it there's a single large vine almost directly in the very center of the greenhouse it coils around a thick metal pole huge red thorn sticking out of its skin and it's almost as tall as the roof of the greenhouse itself and in the pot just visible reaching up from underneath the dirt you see five emaciated fingers good <laughs> um i'd like you I to make a sanity I... check please yeah that that tracks um fail fail that is a loss of one day three yeah i lost two. Oh no yeah two um down 62 Okay, I want to go check out those fingers. Yep. Well, I don't want to, but... As you creep towards this pot in the centre of the greenhouse, I'd like you to make a spot hidden check, please. Fail. Fail. Would you like to push that? Yeah, right. Fail. Fail. You hear the rustling of leaves and petals rubbing against each other as if dancing in the wind. And they can't be because you're inside a greenhouse. But you see, you miss that flicker of movement in the corner of your left eye. You do not see the rather alien-looking plant with spiky blue-green leaves and a large fleshy white and purple flower uncoiling as you step deeper into the greenhouse. We'll get to that in a moment. You stand in front of the strange potted thorny vine. What do you do? First of all, I'm going to take this opportunity to ask if I've regained any health from the last session. You sure have. You're at full health. Okay, cool. Um, how's full health calculated again? Um, so it's should your sheet should do it automatically. Um, it'll say your max HP. Um, oh, I can't be right. It's giving me 505. No. Um, what's your <laughs> What's your strength con and size? Uh, 40, 50, 50. 40, 50, at 50, your max HP is 10. Okay. That's good. Yeah, it won't change from 505. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah, mine's 850, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so you can always just erase what it says in the HP and then retype your strength con and size it again and it should recalculate it. Um, but what do you do? Yes, sorry. Um, can I see any, like, identifying markings on the fingers at all? Rings? You see... Signs of, dam signs of damage? Mm. You see, about halfway down the ring finger, the edge of something metal just poking up through the dirt. It appears this finger is wearing a ring. Okay. Definitely not putting my hand in there. Yeah, that's probably um, wise. Uh, if there's anything I can grab around, like a screwdriver or something, I'm trying make, to get that. Make a luck check for me. Yeah. Um, fail. Look around. It's your hands or your gun? <laughs> I um gonna leave that for now. Um, what, tell me more about the vine. What can I make out about this 
weird ass vein. You can make a natural world check, even with just the base of 10. Yeah, that's a fail. It's quite unlike any plant you've seen. It's the vine itself is about as thick as your upper arm. And the thorns are long, sharp, and red. They look less like thorns and more like little daggers. Okay. Concerning. So you're not going to dig dig up the hand? Uh, fine. <laughs> yeah, I'll dig up the hand. Forced to use only your hands, you swallow, <gasps> prepare yourself, and start to part the earth. And as you dig the hand up, I'd like you to make a sanity check, please. Us? Pass. You lose 1d4 san. As you unearth the hand, grab it by the wrist and hoist it up. Revealing that the hand is attached to what appears to be a shapeless mass of pus, flesh, blood, and bone, all compacted together in unnatural angles. This sickening growth is definitely unnatural. At this point, I am going to go check on my boy Earl. Earl. Yeah. At this point, you, you, in spite of yourself, you scream, oh, drop the hand, it clatters back down into the pot, and as you whirl around, you hear a hissing, hissing sound. <laughs> and there you see the strange flesh, white, fleshy, purple flower in full bloom its petals extended the entire flower almost the size of you and from the bud in the very center of the flower just meters away from your face a strange yellowish gas begins to emanate filling your nostrils with a sickly sweet smell what do you do uh, I'm immediately going to try and cover my mouth with, like, my shirt or whatever, something. Go ahead and make a con check for me. You will be doing it with disadvantage, as you did not see this plant unraveling itself. Yeah. Um, so I roll two and I get the worst? Yep. Okay, that's 88 and 73, so yeah, 88. 88. That's a fail. That's a fail. You grab the hem of your jacket, pull it up and cover your nose as quickly as you can, holding your breath. But the gas is expelled incredibly fast. Within seconds, it fills the air around you. And as you cover your nose and begin to run towards the entrance of the greenhouse, you can't help inhaling at least a little bit of it. You push through the metal door, hear it creak open, and then, as soon as the sunlight, as soon as the air outside touches you, you feel something within your body begin to roil, something deep within your gut. Go ahead and make another constitution check for me, please. Uh, pass. Pass. You pass this time, which means you'll only take half damage from what's about to happen. Okay. So, 2d8. Let us roll. Okay. Ooh, you're very lucky. So, the 2d8 I rolled came up with 11. If you did not pass that con check, you would have instantly taken 11 damage. (laughs) Feel... You feel yourself beginning to gag. You double over. 
spluttering, coughing up what you've inhaled. It doesn't come out as gas. It comes out as a mixture of white pus and blood. And then to your shock and horror, you see what's happening on your left arm. Your veins, your blood vessels are turning bright, are turning a deep, deep brown colour, expanding before your eyes as they're filled with whatever that strange gas was. Your skin begins to roil and painfully it tears itself off your bone. You scream in agony and terror as your left arm from your elbow onwards detaches from you, falls to the ground and the flesh bubbles and melts, leaving a sickening pile of shapeless brown matter on the ground. Fuck, okay. At this point... So what did I take from that? So you took from that five points of damage. Okay, and you so permanently lost your arm. <laughs> cool. That's why I didn't need an arm anyway. That's fine. It's fine. <laughs> At this yeah, point... Buck went to the hospital. Which arm? <laughs> the left arm. Okay. That's good at least. <laughs> At this point... Fucking you... hell. At this point, hearing your heartbeat beating in your ears, thump, 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 the pain throbbing through every fibre of your being, you hear Earl's voice, distant. Uh, hey, you're gonna want to take a look at... Oh! He begins to <laughs> scream as he turns around, holding his shovel in his hand. His jaw just drops open as he sees you clutching the stump that is your left arm as the skin just beneath your elbow begins to twist and seal the wound shut of its own accord. I'd like you to make a sand check, please. That's a fail. And I'm going to make one for Eugene. And that's a fail for him. You lose 1d6 sen. Oh, good. It's going well. <laughs> I lost four. Four? You're fine. Yeah. Eugene lost five. I'm now going to do an intelligence check for him to see if he comprehends what is happening. And you see it. You see the look on his face change from one of shocked horror to terrified understanding. For the first time, he's seeing what you see. His face screws up in terror. He raises the shovel and he runs towards you, raising the shovel, shovel above his head. Die, monster! Die! He shouts as he charges towards you. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm definitely going to dodge and try to, like, yell at him to get some sense back into him. All right, go ahead, make a dodge check, please. Ooh, um, I failed by six. I'm going to spend that yep, luck. you can spend luck. Yeah, um, and I'm going to be like, Oh, it's me! It's me! He swings his shovel at you. You duck back, still clutching the stump that was your arm. And you shout, it's me! Get a hold of yourself, man! Go ahead and make for me either a psychoanalysis check or a hard charm or persuade. And you're probably going to want that because your psychoanalysis is 1%, I'm presuming. It's 50. Oh, 50. Oh, nice. Well, you can do that. Um, my charm is 25 and my persuade is... Si I'll go 60 for my persuade. Yep. Um, no, I'll go to 6. 6. He raises the shovel once again, ready to bring it down upon you. And then he seems to realise where he is. His eyes grow wide. His mouth hangs open. He drops the shovel, it clatters to the ground at his feet, and then he drops to his knees, wraps his arms around your right leg, and begins to sob. What? What in God's name? What? What the? What's happening? Um, I do not think that 
uh, Chambers has it in him right now to console the man. Yeah. In fact, at this point, Chambers, knowing that you've taken a major wound, I'd like you to make a constitution check. Yep. Uh, pass. Pass. You feel your consciousness beginning to wane, but you mustn't. You mustn't pass out. You lurch forwards, nearly falling on top of Earl. But you manage to maintain control of your body. At the very least, whatever removed your arm is not bleeding. You don't have to tend to the wound. You can count that blessing. Eugene extracts himself from your leg. He looks at you, his face roared in terror, and he says, Is this, is this, is this what we fight against? I, I think that Chambers is just not going to answer, and he's just going to look at him and look at his arm. Earl looks back at you, silent, and then... He gestures towards the vegetable garden behind him. His lip wavers. I, I found... Oh, God. Oh, God, what I, what I found. Do you dare to look? I feel like I can't not at this point. In spite of yourself, you shuffle forwards, pushing him away approach the vegetable patch and peer into the patch of earth into the hole that eugene has dug up rotting rib cages decaying heads and most frightening the grafted atrocities created by an insane madman can be found here headless corpses with legs where the arms should be a human tree trunk with six human feet growing from the ribs numerous limbs and other indefinable lumps of mud-coated human anatomy make another sem check please a uh, five so critical critical pass you still lose 1d4. Fucking hell. Um, that is... 4. 4. You got the maximum. And so, your vision begins to blur. The images pulse and weave before you. And you feel your mouth drop open as... The detached hand the severed legs begin to move begin to crawl out of the earth towards you you open your mouth to scream and we cut to Trixie Trixie I'd like you to make a navigate check please to make see if you can save time on the journey to Danvers Asylum Fail. Fail. I'll push that. You can go ahead. Another thing. <laughs> Try your best to consult the road spirits, as Angel puts it. Trying to read the road map as it bends and flaps in the wind, trying its best to escape your grasp. Danvers Asylum is just outside of downtown. It's isolated, rarely visited. The only one who, of your group has ever been here before is Buck and Chambers, and you've never made the drive yourself, so it takes far longer than it should. The pocket watch that Angel clasps in her hand ticks over 12.30pm. As you step out of the vehicle, slam the door shut and approach the sanitarium. You step into the reception area behind the entrance door and find yourself face to face with two orderlies. Allow me to just consult my notes for a second. 
Sanatorium is an old mansion built in the early 1800s. The grounds are beautifully maintained. It even has a neatly trimmed hedge maze, but you're assaulted by the smell of disinfectant and the shrieks and mad laughter of the inmates as you step inside. The orderly, a small, wiry man wearing a name tag reading Frost looks up from the reception desk and he says visiting hours are at one o'clock on oh hell with it I suppose I can let you in half an hour early who are you here to see Well, darling, that would be just great. Thank you. What's another 30 minutes or so? I've just come to pay a visit to uh, Miss Dunlap. Dunlap? She has a... Dunlap, he says. Well, uh, look, I, uh, I don't know how, you tell you, how to tell you this, but uh, he leans in, narrows his eyes and lowers his voice. Mona Dunlap died... Six years ago, she, she never regained consciousness. The attending physician still works at this facility, but... Uh, well... I could... I could send you in to see him if you like, but I, I'm not sure exactly what that would accomplish. My apologies for your loss, he says, bowing his head. Oh, well, that is terrible to hear. Oh, not well, not no loss to me. Just doing some looking into the mysterious stroke that she had. It's very usual. From is there any way I could speak to this physician and see if what they have gathered? He says he frowns for a moment and he's about to reach for the telephone behind the desk, and then he stops. He looks at you and he says, "I'm sorry." I May I ask your name, miss? Ah, uh, yes. Billy Moores. Behind I've you. I've out of town. I've come to do some look into unusual strokes and other unusual illnesses that leave people comatose, and I was referred to this Dunlap case, and it seems I'm a bit too late, but... Make a fast talk check for me, please. Okay. Stalk. I'll push that. that. Is a pass. A pass. He nods. He picks up the phone and puts his finger. puts his finger in the mechanism. Dials the number. Yes, yes. Uh, no, it's not about her. It's uh, the Mona Dunlap case. Yes, from six years ago. Yes, we got... Look, she said she's doing research and... Oh, you will? You're not busy? Oh, okay, fine. He slams the receiver down and he says, mm, Dr. Phillips will see you now. Uh, follow me. And then Frost leads you through the reception and into the asylum itself behind you angel just looks at him as he passes her by and she says i am angel christ and let me tell you we will make sure miss dunlap's spirit rests peacefully he gives you a sidelong glance trixie he lowers his voice and he says your friends might need to stay in here Oh, yes, yeah, she's been studying so much, too much psychology. I think she's going to get a bit too invested in these cases. <laughs> She'll be fine once we wind, wound down for the night. She's too invested in her work, I find. Leads you into the bowels of the asylum, past cells where inmates rattle the doors, shouting at the top of their lungs, screaming and laughing and catcalling you in equal measure until finally you stand before the door. The face, the nameplate on the door reads, Dr. Phillips, head physician. Orderly Frost leans forward. He knocks and then he looks at you and says, good luck and turns and begins to stroll back towards reception. 
you hear a cough from the other side of the door, and then a voice says, <coughs> Come in, please. Step into Good evening. The Step into the office, saying, good evening, and the yeah, doctor the <laughs> doctor says, good afternoon, miss, uh, holds out his hand. Pleasure to meet you, Julie Moores. I've, I've heard that you were a physician of Miss Dunlap's. Julie Moores, uh, pleasure to meet you. I'm Dr. Phillips, Byron Phillips. Behind you, Angel laughs, <laughs> and I am Angel Christ. He exchanges a strange glance with you. He says, So, uh, take a seat. He gestures towards the seat in front of his metal desk. You notice that on the desk there's an open book. It seems to be some treatise on mental illness. He's in the midst of reading a chapter about delusions. He folds his hands together as he leans over the desk. So, uh... Orderly Frost said you were looking into mysterious strokes, uh, delusions that lead to death. You want to talk to me about Mona Dunlap, am I correct? Yes, that's correct. I, I did hear that she did have serious circumstances of medical issues and that she'd just recently passed due to them. It, we were just wondering if there was anything in particular that seemed... Maybe out of the ordinary, if she was under any excessive stress that might have caused it. He brushes his hand in the air. So, not much to say, Miss Moore. She was brought in here, catatonic, couldn't say a thing, and, well, she died before she was able to re re regain consciousness. We never found out what got her to that state. Uh, he trails off, and for a moment... You get the impression that he was about to say something, but then he cuts himself off and he says, Oh, no, a tragedy, all, all things considered. Sadly, that's all we were able to never find out about Miss Dunlap's case. I see, and who brought her in? Was it her employer? I heard she was assisting with a delivery when she had a medical issues. Yes, uh, Mr. Bernard Corbett brought her in. Uh, well, he never came back to identify the body, you know, as a formality. Uh, the city, unfortunately, had her had her buried at a pauper's funeral. Uh, she didn't seem to have any family. And then, you know, when I think of the circumstances of her death, he starts to trail off again. He says... No, well, I'm afraid I can't help you much more, Miss Moore. Forgive the pun. Is there anything else I can help you with? You get the impression that there is definitely something he's not telling you. You're certain there's nothing that you might suspect or anything that could attribute to this? Because seem very unusual and we do want to do our best to prevent this from happening to anyone else perhaps it's a perhaps it's a risk of the medical profession or something like that to you, see if we can reduce more incidents like this you can make a persuade or a fast talk check persuade or fast talk is a pass he looks you in the eyes, leaning closer. His face is suddenly gaunt, tired. He takes a breath and he says, All right, you didn't hear this from me. Just moments before her death, she did regain consciousness. I, I was there. The words are still burned into my mind. She shouted, It was awful. It didn't have arms or legs or hardly a face. It should have died. It should have died along with the other one. And then she dropped dead. Oh, that is unusual. And there was no thing to give away what she's talking about. I wouldn't hope she was talking about the infant. 
No, no, none at all, ma'am, and I do hope she was not talking about the infant. If it didn't have any arms or legs or a face, then it wasn't long for this world, whatever it was. And with the other, yeah, that is very strange. Well, thank you very much, that has been mighty helpful. It certainly sounds like she had to, some, something on her mind. Best of luck, Miss Moore. And a word of advice. There was something about... Something about the whole case that... Well, I, I've never quite been able to get it out of my mind uh, ever since it happened. Just stay on your guard, Miss Moore. Thank you. I'll, I'll keep that in mind. Tips his hat to you and you step out of his office. And as he does, the words repeat in your mind didn't have arms or legs or hardly a face should have died should have died along with the other one we swap over to buck for our final scene tonight buck you climb out of chambers car making sure not to slam the door as you want to do your very best to bring it back to chambers with not a single scratch on it, blissfully unaware of the state that Chambers is currently in. Your boots crunch on the concrete as you walk towards the apartment tenement that Tomaszewski resides in. You step up to the porch. The front door appears to be locked, but you see beside it sort of radio built into the brick wall there's a series of buttons each one with a label and a number next to it so that you can buzz oh. the individual residents what number is this apartment again one, 201 I think 201 201 uh i'm gonna press the button um and see if he responds you press the button, you hear an electronic buzz. Bzzz. And then a voice says, I'm not buying anything. Go away. Uh, Buck is going to uh, ex accept that response for now and uh, look under the doormat. You see a little doormat. It says welcome right in front of the entrance to the tenement. You lift it up. Sure enough, there's a little copper key underneath. It has the numbers 201 engraved on it. Uh, Buck's going to attempt to use that for the front door of the tenement just to see if that happens to let him into the main building exterior itself. Insert the key into the door and turn it and there's a click. It appears that the residence keys are what allow them to enter the tenement. You push the door open and find yourself in a narrow concrete hallway that leads to a stairwell right at the end and an elevator directly to your left. Um, Buck is going to step back outside to the front of the building. Sure. Uh, and press uh, press the number for 201 again. Press it again. There's an electronic buzz. Bzz. And this time, there's no response. Mm. Uh, all right. Uh, then in that case, uh, Buck is going to um, step up the stairs slowly and uh, move towards room 201 and listen. Uh, like, press his ear up against the door. Yep. So you make your way up the staircase, and the tenement appears to be completely abandoned. If there's anyone living here, they're not willing to come out. The other apartment doors are shut tight. The hallway outside apartment 201 is dim and dusty. The air is stale and heavy. I'd like you to make a listen check, please. Can do. Uh, that's not a skill of mine, that's just 20. Let's see. Uh, 34. I might push that and see what happens. Go ahead. 
Uh, 30, that's a little better, but still not good enough. Not enough. You creep towards the door, press your ear up against the thick wood, and from the other side you hear the sound of what appears to be a cupboard door shutting, and then a voice saying, Cups are onto me, cups are onto me. I ain't going down without a fight. Oh, how does Buck want to play this? On one hand, he has at least two guns. Uh, on the other hand, starting a firefight with a civilian doesn't sound like the right thing to do. No, um, not at all. Uh, he's got a knock on the door. And, knock. Um, uh, yep. Call, call out to him. You say, excuse me, uh, uh, Mr. Randall, Randall Tomaszewski? There's silence for a moment, and then you hear a voice. Yeah? What of it? Who are you? Uh, I'm with the Tenants Association. Uh, we've been getting some word of some, uh, strange noises coming from your apartment. I thought I'd be best to come in and check on you. I'd like you to make another listen check. No problems. Uh, that's a fail, but I will push it again. Oops. Uh, that's a pass, 16. Press your ear against the wood once again. You think you hear the sound of what appears to be a gun being cocked, and then a voice, Tomaszewski, muttering under his breath. Even worse, bitch down the halls called the superintendent. Oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I got to hide all the shit, man. Uh, yes, uh, I'll be with you in a moment. And then you hear footsteps oh. as Tomaszewski makes his way across the apartment to the door. Um, Buck is going to, uh, uh, I'm assuming there's a peephole in the door, right? There is a peephole in the door. Uh, then I would very much like Buck to, um, pull out, uh, pull out his pistol, uh, so his revolver, and cock it and uh, kind of put it in his pocket or like out, out of the line of sight of where the um, peephole would be able to see. Yep. And just uh, smile, try and put on a, a, a smiling face, just like a non-threatening uh, aura. But he's absolutely ready to um, pull, pull the gun on him. Absolutely ready. You hear the sound of the door being unlatched. You stand there trying to look as non-threatening as possible. The door opens just enough to reveal Tomaszewski's thin, rat-like face, his wiry, dirty brown hair. He narrows his eyes, he looks you up and down, and he says, Yes? Noises, you say? Well, look, I've been doing some uh, home improvement inside. Look, I, I can show you what I've been working on if that will uh, satisfy you. Uh, Buck going to take this opportunity to um, definitely gain entry. Um, yeah, that would be fantastic. Renovations, you say? Have you got a permit for that? You know you don't own this building, right? He says nothing. He just shuts the door and then you hear the sound of a chain being unlatched he pulls it open and gestures for uh, you to enter Buck is going to train his gun directly on him right away yep so just pull out your gun as so you pull out your gun you realize that Tomaszewski holds in his right hand a sawn off hunting shotgun he's about to raise it to face you and you raise your gun pointed at him and then the two of you are locked in sort of standoff. I knew it, says Tomaszewski. Just like Corbett said, <laughs> it's only a matter of time before you found me. But if I die, I die knowing that my lord will soon rise. Uh, Buck is going to um, train his gun on him and say, don't you raise that. We gotta talk about Corbett. Make an intimidate check, please. 
Absolutely. That's something Buck can do. Um, nope, that's a fail. I'm going to push that. Uh, 28, that's a pass. You see Tomazuski tighten his finger ever so slightly on the trigger of his shotgun. And then he frowns and he says, Hmm, hell. I'm either dying in a blaze of glory or I'm dying in the service of my lord. What would you like to know? Uh, Buck's going to gesture for him to throw away the gun first. Yeah, put that down, then we'll talk. Make another intimidate check. Uh, 76, that's a fail. Uh, I'm going to push that. Uh, 57, that's also a fail. He shakes his head. It ain't going anywhere. Speak, or I shoot. Uh, Buck quickly puts together a game plan. Um, he's seen uh, the pentagram uh, in the office. He's seen um, everything Corbett's been doing. He, he knows has. about how he's been abducting um, parts of people from the hospital. You know, I think you've been uh, uh, laying your laying your uh, bed down with the wrong people here. Mr. Corbett, you've been uh, you've been stealing shit from uh, from the hospital, taking people's limbs for God's sake. What are you up to? Tomaszewski smiles and he says, "No, no, no, Corbett. Corbett is a servant of the Dark Master, and those organs. <laughs> I suppose I can tell you, because you're not going to live much longer if Mr. Corbett has anything to say about it." Those organs are being fed to wild animals so they can develop a taste for the flesh of children. These beasts are going to be possessed by my evil lord and go on a rampage. And the great Satan... ...shall rise in Boston. <laughs> he begins to laugh maniacally, and it's at this moment that you realize that this guy is insane. You peer um, just beyond him, and you can see the small one-room apartment beyond him. The place is filled with the paraphernalia of his bizarre beliefs. There are pentagrams scrawled on the walls, on the floors, paintings of devils and demons, off-kilter sketches that appear to have been drawn by Tomaszewski's own hand of his dark master, Uh, Buck, Buck is going to try not to take his eyes off um, off of him while he quickly like looks around uh, and then uh, trains his eyes back on him. Uh, is there a chance that perhaps he is laughing so much that I could get uh, get in and take the gun off him or like you can grab try. his wrist or something? Yeah, you can try. I'd like you to go ahead and make a fighting brawl check, please. Fantastic. That is something he's quite okay at. Uh, 29, that is a pass. 29, okay. So it's just a normal pass? Uh, just a normal pass. I could spend some luck to bring it to a hard pass. Um, um if you, you want know, to, I'm gonna you do can. that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to spend the 7 to bring it down. Contest it with his. Yeah, so I'm going to spe uh, spend 7 to bring it down, so it brings it down to 44 luck. Oh, no, I'm not rolling 60 100-sided dice. I'm rolling 100-sided dice trying to beat 60. Oh, okay. God, please not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there we go. I take the um, luck back. <laughs> you rush towards him as he's in the midst of laughter, raising your gun in one hand and with your left hand reaching for his, reaching for his wrist, trying to disarm him. But he's faster than he looks he ducks out of the way just at the last moment jumps back into his apartment raises his gun and pulls the trigger bang make a dodge check or you can make a firearms check if you want to f duck for cover and fire back um is it a, just a double barrel shotgun it's just a double barreled sawn off sh shotgun okay so he's only gonna have like two shots in that uh, i'm gonna dodge then all right um, 61, that is a pass. A pass, alright, we're gonna go... I won. Bang! He rolled a hard pass. 
Mm. Whether it's sheer luck or the fact that you're so close together, you jump back, press yourself up against the wall in the hallway, taking cover just as he fires, and bang! His shell shreds the doorway, sliding into your arm, and you take... six points of damage as Ooh. some of the buckshot lands in your rib, filling your body with pain. Make a constitution check. No problems. Um, that is a 69. That's a pass. That's a pass. Your vision begins to blur. You blink your eyes, shake your head, reach for your own weapon. You're not going out like this. Behind you, Tomazuski is laughing like a maniac. <laughs> you hear him cock the gun, ready to try again. What do you do? Uh, I'm going to take a shot at him. Yeah, go ahead. Make a firearms Absolutely. check. Yep, so that's a uh, 71 to pass. Let's see. Uh, 46. So that's a regular pass. I'm going to roll for his dodge. That's a fail for him. You step out from behind cover, raise your gun, point it at him, and bang! The bullet slams straight into center mass. Go ahead, roll damage. Ooh, uh, let's see. So that's 1d10 plus 1d4 plus something? What is that? Yeah, 1d... So, so it's a pistol, so it's just going to be... Yeah, 1d... Uh, what type is it? What type of gun is it? Uh, it's a 44 revolver. 44 revolver, yeah. So it's just a 1d10 plus 1d4. Yeah, okay. So 1d10 plus 1d4. So the 4 is 3, and the 10 is a... Uh, that is a 9, so that's a 12. 12. Bang! The bullet finds him center mass. He opens his mouth, letting out a gurgle. <laughs> Blood shoots out of his mouth as he coughs one last time. <laughs> he fires his gun. Bang! Blindly in the air, the bullets slam into the ceiling, showering you with plaster and dust, and then he falls forwards, dead. You have killed a man. Please make a sand check. Oh, I didn't want it to go down like this. <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, uh, that's a 38. That's a pass. A pass. But only just. You lose 1d4 sand. You won't lose it again. Killing gets easier after the first time. Ah, oh, that's a 1. So it brings me down to 42. Randolph Tomaszewski lies dead at your feet in a pool of his own blood. Now that you're able to get a good look at the poor thing, you see his left arm covered in... At first you think they're tattoos, but no. Then you realise the man has carved pentagrams into his own flesh. Um, do I notice anything in the room, uh, like that might be uh, potentially of use to my investigation or anything on his person? Now yeah, that I'm, uh, make a over him? spot hidden check for me. Uh, that is eighty. That's a fail. I'm gonna try again. I'm gonna push yep. it. Trying not to think about the buckshot. Uh, nope, that's another fail. Wincing with the pain, you look around, you try to search his room as best you can, you shove away paraphernalia off the couch, and everything's blurring and wavering in front of you, your vision's growing red, you only manage to find one thing of note, and that's the last thing you check as you leave the building. You see his Calvinator, refrigerator, standing off to the side in the kitchenette, and it stands out to you. This is the 1920s. These things are expensive. An orderly like Tomaduski could not afford a refrigerator like this. It was a gift from someone, someone with enough money to spare. And as you approach it, you see a piece of paper pinned to the door, handwriting written in a neat but archaic scrawl. The letters begin to twist and squirm 
in front of you as you try to focus. It reads, A gift to my faithful servant from your good friend Bernard. Keep the baby food fresh. Uh, Buck is going to be putting everything together very quickly in his head at this point. If he were a smarter man, he probably would have done it sooner, but he is not. Um, He's going to um, steal himself, uh, knowing what he's going to see in the refrigerator, and open it anyway. He steals himself, holds his breath, he reaches forward, wraps his hand around the refrigerator door, and wrenches it open. Make a sand check for me, please. Ah, lucky boy. Uh, that's 18. 18. That's a pass. You lose one sanity. The stench of decay fills your nostril as you peer inside the refrigerator. The shelves are stocked with what appear to be the bodies of household pets, dogs, cats, puppies. And there... Beyond all of them, wrapped in a paper bag. A tiny leg, about the length of the tip of your finger to your ankle, the foot itself, is barely a third the size of your palm, a baby's foot. And there, the back of the fridge, seemingly painted in blood, a phrase gifts for the key and the gate make a Cthulhu mythos check for me please let's see come on dice um 89 that is not a pass 89 doesn't mean anything to you but as you read it A chill runs down your spine, the key, and the gate. You begin to hear movement beyond the walls in the next apartment. Someone roused from their sleep by the sounds of gunshots, footsteps echoing on wooden floors. What do you do? Uh, Buck is going to grab something from the fridge, uh, probably probably the foot, and um, chuck it in his pocket, uh, recognizing that um, given given the previous experiences, he's going to need something like this, maybe. Yeah. Um, especially if it has something to do with um, what Corbett's doing. Um, stuff that in his pocket and wander out into the hallway. Um, he's going to quickly make his way to the car as best he can, and uh, any tenants along the way, he's going to try and. Uh, Quip to them. Yeah, tenants association business. Go about your days. Luckily, you don't have to do that. It appears there's only one other resident in the building. You can hear them shuffling in room 202 as you shove the severed foot into your coat pocket and make your way out into the hall, pulling the door shut behind you. You hear footsteps approaching the door of 202, Clutching the side, clutching your side, trying to stem the bleeding. You shuffle to the staircase, make your way down. And eventually, you're not sure how, but you're sitting in the car, sitting in the driver's seat, your hands on the wheel. And as you reach over to turn the ignition, you hear a woman scream coming from the building behind you. And we shall end the session there. Oh, good session oh. went great for me. <laughs> oh, lucky boy. <laughs> that was pretty relaxing. Yeah. Oh, Trixie's doing Trixie fine. Going to the library. <laughs> <laughs> Trixie's doing just fine. Yeah. He's going to come back and see us soul and be like, wow, what a day you've had. <laughs> Bug up, so like, uh, how does that feel? <laughs> <laughs> so, your investigations, for the most part, have been completed. Next session, you will regroup at Dr. Earl's rental property, 
try to tend your wounds as best you can. And then, then it's time to make a move. You've gathered enough evidence that something's going on in Bernard Corbett's house. And if you put your minds to it, a sickening suspicion might begin to grow. All the tools are available. Let's see if you can bring him down next time in part two of the legacy of Mr. Corbett. That was The Legacy of Mr. Corbett, Part 1, Episode 4 of Call of Cthulhu, Edge of Madness. A Call of Cthulhu 7th Edition actual play podcast presented by DM Fia with me, Dale, as Keeper of Arcane Law, Ash Gray as Agent Robert Chambers, NCS as Howie Gordon, Toxie as Angel, and Lynx as Trixie. Background music in this podcast was created by Kevin McLeod and is used with permission.